um, welcome everybody. Um, so uh, the next speaker uh, at the symposium uh, doesn't really need an introduction. Um, you probably all know him, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction anyway. So uh, Emmanuel Candice uh, started at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, then did a PhD under the equally famous uh, David Donahoe. Uh, then he became professor in statistics. He then went uh, to Caltech for a period of nine years, I believe, and went back to Stanford, where he currently holds the Barnum Simons Chair in Mathematics and Statistics. And I would like to stress that uh, Emmanuel's research is not just pure statistics, it's really mathematics and statistics. He's probably most famous for starting off uh, compressed sensing jointly with Fields Medal winner Terence Tao. So compressed sensing is now a very big field in its own, very interesting both mathematically and with many practical applications. And uh, well, he has basically won more awards than I can mention here. Let me very briefly say the highest award of the NSF, the Waterman Award, the Polya Prize, a MacArthur Fellowship, and then he's, of course, a member of the American Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the AMS. So uh, today he's going to talk about conformal prediction, which uh, I know from experience is a very interesting subject. And it's high time that more statisticians start working on it. So uh, thank you, Emmanuel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for the very gracious introduction. And thanks to everyone for tuning in, either on Zoom or via YouTube. Uh, I wish I could see you in person, but this is not possible. I hope so that we're going to get through the other side of this pandemic pretty soon, because one thing I really miss are these scientific meetings in person. And uh, I miss non-virtual interactions with my staff colleagues, so I hope I can see you all soon. So uh, as Peter just said, uh, I'll be talking about conformal prediction. It's a very exciting field of research in my view. And I would like to tell you a little bit where we stand today. Uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to thank Rina Adityan Ryan, who introduced me uh, to this field. And so, uh, because of them, uh, this has shaped my research in the last year or two. And so, thank you. Thanks a lot. So, by means of introduction, you know, we could look at machine learning 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I actually worked on this. You know, the goal was to predict movie ratings. And honestly, between you and me, whether we get this right or wrong is not is without consequences, right? But now when we look at, fast forward to today, and we look at applications of machine learning tools, they also call AI in the popular press, but it's really the same thing. Um, you know, we use uh, machine learning to recall, uh, to recognize drivers on the streets. Uh, in the United States, uh, we use machine learning to inform courts' decisions, to assist judge in making decisions about which inmates should get parole and which image should not and who gets bail and who doesn't. And so I cannot think of a more uh, sensitive application of machine learning ideas. And the stakes are, of course, extremely high because we're deciding who stays in jail and who doesn't. Um, uh, in the business world, HR departments uh, are, of course, using now more and more machine learning to recruit employees and, and the young people who may be listening in. Um, and uh, everywhere you look, you hear about machine learning, AI to improve business science. You know, there is a promise that AI will improve medicine and healthcare. And so, of course, we're kind of far away from what people were doing 15, 20 years ago. Now, whether you get your answers right or wrong does really matter. And so um, with this, we'll talk a little bit about fairness as well. You know, it's been widely reported that machine learning algorithms may be biased against certain groups, and we're going to pay attention to this. But what I would like to stress at the moment is, as I mentioned before, we are entering an application, an, an era where we use machine learning more and more in very sensitive applications. And I think it's extremely important that as statisticians, as professionals, as data scientists, we'd be able to convey uncertainty and reliable outcomes. I'll give you an example to exemplify my point. Uh, let's say that, you know, a bit like this HR department, let's say that a university is receiving lots of applications. Let's say Stanford receives about 60,000 applications each year, 
and they would like to automate part of the admission process. And so they might like to predict how some applicants yeah. are at Stanford <coughs> um, admitted. So we might, there might be a quantitative outcome that we're interested in predicting, for example, the GPA after two years of undergraduate education. And I may have about each applicant a lot of features, the high school they went to, the, the grades they got, the courses they took, the ACT scores, their social economic status, uh, their level of physical fitness, information about um, outside curricular activities, and so on and so forth. And so I may want to learn from the experience of others, have some sort of a predictive engine, and perhaps a predictive engine in this case will return a predicted range, which is 3.62. And what is an admission officer supposed to do with this? Um, how accurate is this prediction? So as we see, we are using now machine learning algorithm that leads to prediction, and these predictions are used to take actions. And so we need to seriously evaluate the cost of getting our predictions wrong. So we need reliable systems, and we need to be able to communicate reliable prediction and the uncertainty that come with it. And the way I think about this really is that um, what we should be doing instead of returning point estimates, we should returning, be returning what, I'm, what people call prediction input. That is, instead of just saying 3.62, you might want to be able to return 3.2 to 3.8, and I want some guarantees about this prediction interval. This is not a confidence interval. We're not trying to estimate, uh, we're not building a confidence interval around a parameter. We're building a prediction interval about a future observation, and I want this prediction interval to have the property that 90% of the time I'm correct. That is, if I look at all my applicants, and for each of them, I build a confidence, a, a prediction interval. Then I want that this prediction interval covers the true outcome 90% of the time. And that would be a very good natural way to communicate uncertainty so that we can inform reliable decisions. But we don't see prediction intervals being reported very often. And why is that so? Well, one of the reasons, I suppose, is that we're using uh, extremely fancy tools to actually fit for predictive modelings. Uh, random forest, XGBoost, neural nets with so many layers. These models are way beyond past regressions. We don't have formulas to compute prediction intervals and so on. And so perhaps that explains why we don't, we tend to under-report, um, under-evaluate uh, uncertainty quantification. But what we'll see in this lecture is this is kind of wonderful field, as I mentioned earlier, of conformal prediction that will let us actually build very accurate prediction interval, no matter what black box you use. And you don't even actually need to know the details of the black box. So as a starter, uh, let's look at uh, a very naive way of building a prediction interval. Again, I insist that we want to predict why, not the mean of y even x. So perhaps what I would do is I would fit a regression function, which you see in red. I would look at the residuals, the deviation from the actual observation from my fitted uh, regression function. And that's what you see on the left. On the right, sorry, I would have a histogram. And to report a predictive interval, I might actually take the regression estimate you had and add or subtract the quantiles of the residual. But you know, I know I'm talking to a professional audience, you know that it's a very, very bad idea because we're looking at each sample residuals and they're way too small. So that of course would not work. The residuals I'm getting are much smaller on the training set that they would be on future samples. This is of course extreme for neural networks where as I'm sure you're aware of sometimes people drive the training error to zero, which means that the residuals are always zero, which means that essentially your confidence band would have zero width. Um, the residuals are much smaller than on test form and that would not work. So this is where uh, conformal prediction enters the picture. Uh, as I said, uh, it was started uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, I think that's the first paper uh, discussing the key ideas. And what we've learned from this paper and the vast literature since then is that predictive inference is possible under no assumptions whatsoever, other than having IID data or not even uh, exchangeable data would suffice. So um, I want to kind of uh, 
give you a sense of the major players in this area, the field was largely developed around Vladimir Voft. Uh, he contributed in the late 90s and he contributes to this field to this day. So there's been 20 years of sustained uh, innovation in conformal prediction. And if you look at his production, you'd see new papers coming about just about every month about conformal prediction. And it's been wonderful to see. I would also like to acknowledge Jean Lay and Larry Wasserman, who realized the importance of Bovik's idea and his colleague's idea, and basically alerted the statistics community to what was going on in computer science, and also in the process, of course, made fantastic and wonderful contributions on their own. So what's the idea of conformal prediction to statisticians? It would look uh, quite straightforward initially. Uh, what you do, of course, is you do not look at in-sample residuals. You look at the out-sample residuals, and they are bigger than the in-sample residuals. And so when I look at the out-sample residuals, I can actually instead look at the quantiles of the outside sample residuals. And by definition, this means that 90% of the future test point will fall within this band. This can be... Uh, uh, collected in a formal statement, which is that if I'm looking at the quantiles of out-of-sample residuals, we're going to say that we look at them on a, what is called a calibration set in the field, which is not used to fit the regression function. Then I can construct the uh, prediction interval in the usual way, and I'm guaranteed to get 90% coverage, or whatever level you set, just by looking at out-sample residuals. Now, you can, of course, uh, this out-of-sample residuals is a form of conformity scores, which is another terminology in the field, S of x, y, right? So which measures here the deviation between the observed value and the fitted value. And why do we stop here? We can actually use any conformity scores, S of x, y. This is kind of a test statistic, if you will. Think about it as a z-score. And instead of just looking at the absolute value of the residuals, we could look at any conformity scores and build a prediction interval essentially using the same recipe where a point Y, a response Y, would be included in the prediction interval if its conformity score is low enough. And that's, that, if, if you want, if its this score is low enough. And that, the way they talk about it in conformal prediction would be to say that Y conforms to previous values that you've observed. And so the general result uh, uh, from, from these pioneers is that if I take Q to be the 90th percentile of conformity scores that I've seen on a holdout set, on a calibration set, then your prediction interval, the interval you construct to predict future values of Y will have the right coverage probability. And this is actually an easy result, and I thought I could perhaps walk you through the, a very elementary proof, which actually takes only uh, two lines, is I get to see a bunch of conformity scores on a holdout set, so i equals 1 to n, and these are represented with these yellow dots. And now I need to make a guess about y n plus 1. So the conformity score for the n plus 1, the test point, the n plus 1 data point, which is our test point, uh, we're going to just use a very basic property, which is that if the data x, y, y, r are exchangeable, or a, a, a simplification would be that they're iid, then these conformity scores are also iid. And in particular, the rank of a conformity score uh, will be a discrete uniform random variable. And because I choose a quantile to be the quantile of conformity scores, it's very quick to see that by construction, I'm going to include the point in the confidence interval if the rank of the conformity score for the test point is below Q, which by definition is 90% or whatever level uh, you choose. And so it's a very simple argument. And of course, uh, people in statistics should be reminded of uh, all the literature on non-parametric testing, and it's, of course, very close to this. So now, what do we want to talk about today? So we're going to compute conformity scores, and the question is, it's a bit like testing. Which test statistics should we use? Which conformity scores should we use? And as we'll see, we'll see that 
uh, it makes a big difference uh, which conformity scores you build. So in the first part of this talk, I would like to talk about uh, more adaptive conformity scores. So just to a bit illustrate what I'm talking about, suppose that I've got a data set. These are the black points you see on the figure. And suppose that I actually I gave away the problem, which means that the distribution of y given x is known. Then in that case, I can fit upper and lower quantile functions, right? So I would know the rate distribution, the conditional distribution. I would know the quantiles of all these distributions. I could connect them. And so I would be able to, get, to construct superb uh, prediction intervals. Note that the width is not zero, no matter the sample size. There's uncertainty in y. But what we can see is that the length of the interval can vary greatly with, with x because we may have heteroscedastic data. Now, the issue is that in the method I propose, where we actually fit a regression function and then enlarge the, you know, create a band around the regression function of fixed widths, um, then we tend to get prediction intervals that do not adapt to x. And uh, we get prediction bands of fixed widths, which may not be desirable, because we know that the, perhaps the, the oracle um, uh, prediction intervals would be highly dependent on your location in, 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 in X space. All right, so, but of course, we do not have the distribution of Y given X, otherwise there would be no problem whatsoever. We just get a sample, and we want to make inference, again, prediction intervals without making any assumption on either the distribution of X or the distribution of Y given. So one thing that always found, we found strange at Stanford is that if the goal is to construct a prediction interval, why do you start by estimating the mean? Really, the target is really the quantile of the conditional distribution. So why don't you just estimate this directly? And so of course, we can do this by this wonderful idea of Kunker and Bassett, which is a few decades old of quantile regression. And so what we're suggesting here is to bring together quantile regression and conformal prediction. In particular, if you have your favorite machine learning algorithm, be it a neural net or XGBoost or whatever you, you want to use, what we're suggesting is that you should replace the loss function, the square loss function, with, I like this name a lot, the p-bell loss, right? And so people familiar with quantile regression will see that this is essentially when you have a, a, a loss that looks like this, you're, you're estimating the alpha percentile of the distribution of y given x. So just change the loss function from the squared loss to the pinball loss, fit it with alpha equals 0.05, alpha equals 0.95, and you're gonna get two quantile regression function, one for the lowest quantile and one for the upper quantile. And so you can do this on data, and maybe that's a better strategy, but of course, if I fit quantiles, would it work? And the answer is, well, no, it doesn't. Uh, you know, quantile regression has no guarantees of any kind that I'm aware of in finite samples. And so, <clears throat> you know, what we see is this, is we see this on, 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 the, on my test example. You know, when I gave the method of a, a fresh um, test data set, I could see that the actual coverage was 72% instead of 90%. And of course, it can be much worse imagining that you're again training neural nets than essentially your two quantiles will be the same, and so you'll be overfitting tremendously. So we need to adjust uh, these quantiles, and um, this is what we're gonna use ideas from conformal prediction, but perhaps in a novel way, where just as before, we're gonna train, we're gonna split our data into a training set and a calibration set. On the training set, we're gonna fit, we're gonna use quantile regression to get a sense of where the quantiles of the conditional distributions are, but we know we're not doing a bit good job. We're not perfectly calibrated. And so we're gonna see how well we're doing on the holdout set, on the calibration set. And this is what you see on the right. You have green points on the holdout set and you're gonna score them. You're gonna give them this sort of famous conformity scores I was talking to you about. Now, what scores do you get on the calibration set? Um, what we thought of is uh, going to be extremely simple. Um, we're going to measure the distance of a calibrated point to the nearest boundary. And we're gonna, it's going to be a sign distance 
So if you're outside of the predicted range, you're going to get a positive sign. So it's going to be a, the positive distance to the nearest boundary. If you're inside the calibration bound, band, you're going to get a negative sign. So it's a distance to the boundary with a sign which is positive if you're outside and negative if you're inside. Okay, and the details are over here. Now, let's say I have 500 calibration points. I have, therefore have 500 scores, 500 sign distances. Let's say I want to construct a 90% confidence a prediction interval. Then I'm going to look at the 90th largest values of this scores, like the 450th largest value of these 500 scores, the 90th percentile of this score. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move up and down my quantiles by this value Q, right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to shift the lower and upper quantile functions by an amount Q, which is the quantiles of this conformity scores. So what we can see is if I have uh, I'm tending to overfit, so undercover, then of course more than 10% of the point will be outside of the prediction band, in which case Q would be positive, and so I would enlarge the prediction interval. If on the other hand I started with a very conservative method, and that's a nice thing about this method, which I'm overcovering, then Q would be negative and I would actually shrink the uh, uh, prediction intervals. And of course, if I started with something that was just about perfect, well, Q would be roughly zero and I would actually not touch it. So this is how the method works. And uh, when we apply it on the, the test data you've seen before, uh, then we get, we want 90% and the actual Video. coverage of the curve is 90.01%. Okay, so it seems to work extremely well, but it's not surprising because it's an application of, of conformal prediction with just new test scores. Now, if we look at how the method performs next to uh, the method I presented earlier, uh, based on the absolute value of the residuals, you know, here we have essentially a confidence band whose width does not change with x. On the right, we have this new method that uses quantile regression, and we get, as you can see, prediction intervals whose width highly depends on x. It's highly adaptive. And so we have a highly adaptive method while the original method is not. And so one of the benefits that we can see that because of this, we tend to achieve um, better efficiency. And by that, I mean that the average length of the interval is shorter. So this is uh, to repeat this point again. This is the right plot where I show the length of the CQR intervals, uh, the method we proposed as a function of x, and we can see that it highly depends on x, whereas the length of the original method does not depend on x. And uh, one thing we're going to focus on is the plot on the left, where um, conformal prediction cannot give you conditional coverage, and that's one of the weaknesses of the method. But you may hope to achieve uh, a form of conditional um, coverage. And what we see, at least in this experiment, is that the blue method, uh, as a function of x, seems to maintain uh, coverage at level 90%, no matter where you are in x space, whereas the methods tend to kind of overshoot or undershoot, right? So just if you think about finance, for example, and you're trying to predict stock returns and you have measurements of volatility, well, when the volatility is high, you know, your method might actually undercover when the volatility is low, you might actually way over cover. And so the, the coverage will highly depend on the value of the volatility. What this method does, the blue method seems to hold, at least in this example, coverage constant across all values of x, which is important. OK, so we can look at this on uh, real data as well. And uh, this is a data set where we're trying to use this method to predict utilization of medical services. Um, and uh, the goal here is to predict the num you know, how much of the healthcare system you're going to utilize as measured by the number of visits to a doctor or hospital and so on. And we have lots of covariates, which you can read about, you know, your age, your marital status, your poverty status, your type of insurance, and so on. 
And so when we look at uh, the performance of these methods, uh, both the original method and the CQR method achieve 90% coverage at, at theorem. Um, when we look at length, which is on the right, and conditional coverage, uh, which is in the middle, we can see that this more adaptive method, the CQR method, tends to return intervals that have the same marginal coverage, better conditional coverage, and shorter intervals. So it seems that um, when you have a Toroscale CD, CD, maybe this is one of the tools, one of the conformity scores uh, you would like to use. So you achieve, again, uh, better conditional coverage, and as a result, you, you have shorter intervals. Uh, this is not limited to the kind of this very interesting data set. Uh, we actually tried the method on lots of different data sets. And in lots of cases, we could see that by using a bit, by combining quantile regression with conformal prediction, uh, in many cases, in very different fields, we could achieve uh, better conditional coverage and, and, and shorter days. But I don't want to, to spend too much time on this. Rather, what I would like to do is to extend, expand a bit on how you can build conformity scores. Um, so, you know, what we've done so far is to leverage quantile regression. And so we were getting sort of naive uh, estimates of quantiles and we were moving them up and down by essentially the same amount. We're adding and subtracting the same quantity to the fitted quantiles. What we can do is we can leverage quantile regression a bit more and expand the intervals, not in a uniform way. So let me explain how it works. Suppose that now, instead of fitting a, sim, uh, a pair of quantiles, I fit all quantiles, right? And so I fit, a, I have a bunch of quantile curves, or just a different way to think about this is you fit a conditional distribution function, either via quantile regression or via the wonderful method that Jerry Friedman, my colleague, introduced on uh, contrast trees, you have an idea of what is f hat of y given x, which is a CDF of y at x. Then because you have the CDF of y at x, you can construct a naive interval by just taking the quantiles of your CDF. And that would be a naive way of constructing prediction intervals. Would that work? Well, obviously not. It, it is not calibrated. So what do you do then? Well, what you can do is you can look at, you have your holdout set, and you have this parameter, tau, which is which quantiles of the naive method should I use? And of course, you're going to have a relationship between the row coverage level, the tau, and the actual coverage that you see on a holdout set. And all you're going to do is you're going to pick tau hat, which achieved 90% coverage on the calibration set. And from now on, when I ask you to produce a prediction interval, you're just going to take your naive estimate, not at tau, because it's a wrong value, but at tau hat, which is, in this case, 95%. So you build a, a family of prediction intervals, and you use calibration to actually understand at which nominal level, which nominal level you should use. And What's nice about this is you can, of course, extend this to discrete labels if you want. And so um, is if you're now trying to predict discrete labels, um, you might start with an estimate of conditional probabilities. Now, y is a discrete label given x. And you, know, you could get this by the output of a neural net softmax layer, for example. And it would say that you know, at, for this value of x, these are my estimated class probabilities arranged in a decreasing order. Okay? And so if I have, if I use uh, a, 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 a probability estimate and I need to return to you a prediction set, I would say, well, I'm going to include all the largest, the, the, the class label with the largest probabilities until I reach the 90%, for example. In this case, it would be A, B, C. Would that work? Obviously not, because it's not calibrated. But what you can do, again, is you can use exactly the same method as we've discussed before in the continuous, in the, in the regression case, to calibrate this method in the proper way. And what you would do then, you would say, 
well, you know, I want 90%, but 90% yields on the 85% coverage on a holdout data set. But if I increase it to 95%, I see that I get I achieve 90%. And so you're going to use the same method as we described, but with a level which is not 90%, but 95%. And in this case, what would happen is you would actually include the class label D. Okay, so you construct a prediction set in exactly the same way by, uh, by calibrating the coverage that you really want. Now, of course, we're not the first one to, to uh, before I move on, uh, let's say that um, maybe for people in the audience, it's not exactly clear how, uh, we know what are the conformity scores in all these methods, but I can guarantee that they're lurking in the background and as a result, you just set in motion all the clever thinking and conformal prediction to show that all the methods I've presented uh, achieve exact coverage. So uh, going back to classification, uh, uh, people were, had of course proposed methods to actually deliver prediction sets for discrete levels. And the idea was fairly straightforward, which is you again start with an estimate of conditional probabilities um, of y given x, and you're gonna include y in your prediction set if your estimate probability is large enough. And what does it mean to be large enough? It needs to be above a certain percentile of the probability scores that you've ob observed on a holdout set. Now, this is, a, of course, a very valid method. It will yield 90% coverage, but we can see that it runs into trouble. Again, it's not very adaptive. And so let's look at an example. Suppose we have um, data points that are easy and hard to classify. So on the left here, I have a, 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 a label Y, and these are the estimated class probabilities. And we can see that this label is fairly easy to classify. Here I have a, a label which is perhaps harder to classify, and these are the output of the class probabilities. If the quantile Q is at this level, then in the first case, uh, the method will just return A, which is the correct answer. In this case, the method would actually return an empty set, where I think we can see that we would like to return A, B, C, but it returns an empty set. And the reason it does this is that somehow, again, the threshold, your conformity scores, is not adaptive to X. But if we were to use the method I, I proposed before, this method where you actually fit um, uh, distributions and then you look at the coverage on the holdout data set, um, what we can see is that by using this more fancy method, so this is like your 2013, your 2020, I'm just constructing contrasting the way you actually build prediction sets, you'd see that in terms of conditional coverage, these newer methods, which are more adaptive, would tend to achieve far better conditional coverage, at least on simulated data, and, um, and that's important, because you want to be able to tell that for a person with this X, this is your prediction range, even though you lack theoretical guarantees. In practice, you can hope for conditional coverage. And this is something we see on real data uh, perhaps I'll skip this, but we, of course, did extensive data analysis of, let's say, handwritten digits via neural nets. And when we look at these more modern ways of performing conformal prediction, uh, we see better conditional coverage. All right, so um, uh, I would like to move on. And, you know, this talk is or organized around slight vignettes. So one was to get better conformity score. The other is to look at where we could apply conformal prediction to do something that is perhaps useful. And so I want to discuss a bit about fairness and the need to treat people equitably. So uh, as I've said before, uh, machine learning, you know, we all worry about the potential biases of machine learning algorithms, and we need to be extremely careful in the way we communicate the results of data analysis to policy and decision makers because we want to help people, we don't want to harm people. We cannot do harm. And so of course there's a call of action to design machine learning so that it is fair and not biased against anyone's, any one group. And so just to uh, 
think a little bit about the sensitive application now where, for example, I need to predict something of importance. Um, the question is, well, as I stated earlier, generally how do we communicate uncertainty to decision makers and not fool ourselves in thinking that I know the future. Um, even though I use this powerful machine learning algorithm, there's still tremendous uncertainty about the future. Um, but I think the new point I'd like to touch upon is I have to make sure what we treat everyone equitably. So, of course, there is a large literature in algorithmic fairness and there's a lot of good work. Um, but what we'll see here is that we're going to depart significantly from this literature. In particular, uh, this literature tends to conflate the uh, statistical problem of predicting risk from the policy problem of taking actions and making decisions. And uh, when you conflate these two things, you can actually end up harming quite a few people. And this point was made by Corbett Davis and Goyle. So what we're going to try to do is to use actually ideas from conformal prediction to actually communicate um, what we know about the problem to decision makers in a way that is unbiased towards any, anyone's group. And we're going to decouple this from the policy problem because you might actually correctly infer that the chance of an inmate to commit another crime is 20%, but that number does not determine in and of itself a course of action. So how can we use conformal prediction in this setting? So let's go back to the uh, data set that we've seen before, where I'm trying to use uh, machine learning to, pre to predict how much of an individual is gonna utilize healthcare system. In this data set, I have a sensitive attribute, let's say, which is race. And just as exploratory data analysis, I can actually look at when I fit my fancy black box manual nets, I can actually see what it does on subgroups. Now, if I use conformal inference, of course, I'm guaranteed that on average over future individuals, the coverage will be all right. But, you know, I might be interested in looking at the coverage for the non-white group and the coverage for the white group. And when you actually look at things in details, you'll see that, at least in this example, that the neural network tends to overestimate the response of the non-white group and underestimate the response of the white group. Now, in this case, the bias is not too strong, but you can imagine that the application will be stronger. In any case, the fact that you get different answers for different groups and not the same accuracy uh, can be quite hurtful and lead to discriminatory practices. So it's, this needs to be investigated. And so, but again, we can use conformal prediction to calibrate our predictions even better. Let's say I have two groups, just male and female, to be uh, politically perhaps less sensitive. Um, and what we might actually require from our uh, prediction intervals, which will communicate uncertainty, what I know about the problem, is that they be accurate no matter the group you belong to. And so what we can do is we can say, well, what we're going to prescribe is that you run your fancy algorithm, you run your 100 layer neural nets, whatever I think gives you the, the best accuracy possible. But in the end, I'm gonna be prescriptive. And what I'm gonna require is you're gonna communicate what you've learned from the experience of others in the form of a prediction interval, which is correct no matter what group you belong to. And so this is encapsulated by these two equations, which means my prediction interval is correct if I'm a male, it's also correct if I'm in a female. So I think this way of communicating what we've learned uh, rigorously quantifies uncertainty and treats everyone equitably. It is unbiased across groups. And I, I like it because, you know, it's an honest form of reporting. If the interval that I get at the end of the day is long, it says that the model can say little about my problem. I can also observe that the intervals are of different lengths across men and male and female. And perhaps it's much wider for female than it is for male, perhaps just reflecting the fact that I have less data for female, in which case the decision maker might actually be tempted to collect more data to get more accurate predictions. So now how we're going to use conformal prediction to actually achieve this goal that is fairly straightforward, given everything we've seen so far. Um, we have both a minority and a majority group. The minority group is in orange and the majority group is in blue. And here they are. 
And of course, I can treat them as separate. And so, you know, that would be a bit naive, but I can always uh, treat them separately and apply conformal prediction to each of these groups. But what we find in practice is, of course, uh, when we learn from the experience of others, it might actually be much better to join the two groups in the training stage. And so you can basically develop a powerful model where all your samples are combined, but when you actually calibrate uh, your predictions on the holdout sets, you do it separately for each group. And of course, if you follow this strategy for people who follow me, you know, you'll see that it achieves a prescription that I mentioned here. And so when we actually do this, uh, maybe I'm not gonna look, ask you to look at this table in, its, uh, in all details, but we can focus on the, on the last row. Um, you know, this is a method, this is conformal prediction using this quantile regression, where the data has been pooled for training, for estimating the quantiles, but then these quantiles are adjusted depending on the group you belong to, we see that, and again, it's not surprising that we achieve perfect coverage within for each group and, and, slight, and, and, and short interval lengths. Okay, so there's a way of using conformal prediction to actually do some form of honest reporting. I'm very passionate about this. Um, I recognize that data analysis is not neutral. I think we need to find ways of summarizing information that does not lead to discriminatory or unfair practices. Um, one of the things I'm not sure I like very much about this, the current literature on algorithmic fairness is it's not my job as a statistician to come up with a decision rule, with an action. What I need to do is I need to empower the user and give the user some tools to make informed decisions that are treat people equitably and pe do people no harm. And so, and so uh, this is what I wanted to say about the very interesting interplay between ideas from conformal prediction and, and, and fairness. Okay, so uh, the last uh, stop I wanted to make was about counterfactual inference, where it, again, may be an application that is familiar to almost any statistician I know, where a conformal prediction may play an interesting role. So let me explain this in the last 10 minutes and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so um, as you know, in, in, uh, in some form of randomized experiments, uh, uh, patients come in and I can assign them to either a control group or a treatment group, um, depending on the value of the covariates X. And so in this simple model, we're gonna be assigned to a treatment group given that your covariates are equal to little x with probability uh, e of x, which is known in the field as a propensity score, in which case you become one of these red people. And likewise, it can be assigned to a control group with probability one minus e of x. Okay, so people are assigned to either treatment and control. And uh, I'm sure most people in the audience are familiar with the famous uh, setting of potential outcomes of Neyman and Rubin, where, you know, in the word of Rubin, there is a science table and we only observe, uh, we have a partial view of the science table. And so these are the, actually the observations we got. Uh, we got the response of these treated individuals. We got the response of the uh, control individuals, but there is a counterfactual that we would like to know about which we did not observe. For example, I did not know how this individual would have responded to the treatment. This is unobserved, because this person got the placebo, did not get the treatment, but I might be interested in learning what would have, what, what would have, what would the counterfactual be for this individual, had he or she received the treatment. And so this is a famous counter, in, in, counterfactual inference problem where, uh, again, the dark colors indicate the observed values we get to see. The shaded colors are things we cannot see, but that we would like to know about. And so the fundamental question in counterfactual inference is to understand, or can we say something educated about the value of Y1 for a control individual? That is a response to a treatment for a person who actually did not receive the treatment. 
And so if you're paying attention uh, to what I'm saying, and I'm, I'm sure you are, um, the, we have different groups here. And the top groups are the data we have. The, we do not have any data about the bottom row. And what we can see is we can look at the joint distribution of X and Y um, on this science table. And so I want to kind of guess these shaded red individuals. But you can see that the shaded red individuals have a distribution of X and Y. Of course, I'm interested in the response to treatment. So the response is Y1. But we can see that the distribution of you know, the test samples, if you will, is not the same as the distribution of individuals about which I have data. In particular, there's a covariate shift. That is, I would like to learn from these individuals what a typical response Y1 looks like, but I would like to apply what I've learned for the individual to this individual, but these individuals do not have the same X because they were assigned to a control group. So there's a distribution mismatch, or in other words, a covariate shift that, is, um, that we need to take care of. And so we're way outside of conformal prediction all of a sudden. So uh, to make this a bit clear, uh, what we have here is we have the real world, the treated units. And uh, you know, this is a distribution of the covariates, given that they've been treated, there is a response. And on the right side, we have the counterfactual words. They have a, distrib a different distribution of, counter of, of, of covariates. And I would like to guess their Y1s. I did not observe their Y1s. I would like to guess it, perhaps, from what I see on the left. So the general problem uh, stated in the language of conformal prediction is something like this. I have IID sample from a distribution P of X times P of Y X. These are the training data. This is what I got to observe. And from this training data, I would like to construct prediction intervals just as before but for test data that follows actually a different distribution. And the distribution will be different in the sense that the distribution of the covariate X changes between training and testing. So we have what we're gonna call a covariate shift where we have this weight W, which is the ratio between Q and P. Now in the, length, in the framework of counter factual inference, this would be essentially the ratio of propensity scores. All right, so we, are, we want to apply conformal prediction, but the examples we've got do not look like the target distribution. All right, so this is kind of the abstract version of conformal inference. You compute conformity scores, you look at the quantiles of these scores, and you put a point in the prediction set if the conformity score for that point is below your quantile. But that cannot work when you have covariate shifts. And so what we showed with uh, Ryan Tipsharani, Rina Barber, and Aditya Ramdas is that there is a slight variation on conformal prediction where you can basically reweight the histogram of your conformity scores to achieve um, perfect uh, coverage. And so the way it works, it's very, very simple actually. What you're going to do is you're going to reweight the, the conformity scores you got by reweighting the empirical distribution with the Ws, which are the ratio between the, 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 of, the, uh, of the distribution between the test, the test group and the training sample. And so now you look at this new quantile, and you're just going to apply exactly the same method, except that your quantile is calculated differently via, if you think about it, a form of importance sampling. And when you do this in the, con in the context of counterfactual inference, in the case where you know the propensity scores Wx, uh, you would know how to reweight your conformity scores. And in that case, you get a result that we start to be familiar with, which is that I can actually make counterfactual prediction for a person in the control group. I can construct a C hat that has a probability that it covers 90% of the time almost perfectly. Right? 
And so uh, this holds in the case where you know exactly how to do the reweighting between the, the test and the training sample. Uh, so it's applicable to randomized experiments which have perfect compliance. Um, of course, people know that usually I don't know the propensity scores exactly. I might have a good approximation of it. And so if you look at the details of the paper, you'll see that uh, we can adapt to this situation and have a form of double robustness, which roughly says that if you have a good estimate of either the propensity scores or the quantiles of the distribution, then the equation that you see over here at the top holds approximately. And so now you have a very general method to actually uh, build uh, confidence intervals for uh, prediction intervals, sorry, for uh, counterfactual responses. And you know, again, we can use uh, uh, conformal prediction to do this. We can wrap this again around any algorithm you like, any conformity scores you like. And so if you look at the top three rows here, you see we, abuse, we, we wrap conformal prediction around BART, around boosting, around random forest. And in each case, of course, you achieve exact coverage at the 90% level. If you look at methods that are widely discussed in the literature, uh, they would fail to cover Y1. But with the help of conformal prediction, you can get exact coverage. Um, this is another QQ plot of, uh, now on the right, you see the length of the interval that this conformal prediction method return in this case. Uh, what we can see is, of course, different ways of scoring leads to different performance. So here in this case, random forest appears to be the best method. Um, the blue line here is the length you could get if you knew exactly the right conditional distribution of Y1 and uh, you would not be able to do better than this. And you can see that, yes, you're not on the blue line, but you're not crazy far either. Um, again, uh, we can demonstrate conditional coverage as a function of X. Uh, the top row is what people use at the moment. Uh, the bottom row is a method that have been conformalized with some of the ideas we presented. And again, across a range of X, we can see uh, approximate uh, conditional coverage. Now the work we've done does a bit more and so this is just an invitation perhaps to open it up for people who are interested in the intersection between causal inference and conformal predictions where um, you know in general I may have an individual that comes from a population that I've not seen. It comes from a distribution of x which is q I have the treated unit, I have the control units. And for an individual I've never seen, I might be able to say this, I believe that the individual treatment effect for this individual, which in the field is defined by the difference between the response to treatment and the response to placebo, Y1 minus Y0, you would like to actually get a range for this value, which is valid 90% of the time. And the wonderful work of Liwa shows how this can be done via ideas, again, of conformal prediction. So I think it's going to be time for me to wrap up. Uh, I think I see Peter nodding. So I had one more stop, but you know, since I'm running out of time, I'll just give you some bullet points. Um, you know, I've not actually discussed the case of data reuse. Like, can we actually reuse the sample both for training and calibration? And the answer is yes, we can. In fact, the conformal prediction has a standard way of doing it, which is called full conformal. The problem is that it's computationally extremely prohibitive. So people don't really use it. Um, um, I want to put a little plug for the work of uh, my colleague, uh, Ryan Titrani, Rina Barber, and, and Aditya Ramdas. Uh, we've shown exactly how we can adapt the jackknife and cross-validation to have guaranteed coverage so that your data points can be actually both used to actually estimate the quantiles, if you will, and calibrate at the same time. Uh, what the paper shows is that the jackknife and cross-validated residuals can fail, but we were able to come up with a modification of the jackknife plus and uh, cross-validation that has exact coverage again. And so um, this, is, uh, this is a bit exciting. Now, 
when we did this, we, we did this, and again, uh, the, the big figure of Vladimir Vrov was lurking in the background. Uh, the jackknife plus and CV plus are new methods, but they are related to something he did earlier uh, called cross conformal prediction. And so there's an exciting connection between CV plus, for example, the method we introduced to actually reuse data when, uh, when data, when the sample size is small, and the wonderful ideas of OFC on cross conformal prediction. And what's good about these methods is that they can be adapted to any conformity scores you like, whether you have continuous or discrete labels. And in fact, if you look at our papers and our website, you'll see that in many cases to boost performance, we're not going to use the split conformal approach that I discussed before, but rather these more refined ideas. OK, uh, so I'll skip the jackknife plus um, just to show you that in the spirit of reproducible research, we try to be good citizens and uh, put some software and examples out that people can reproduce our results and play with code. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. It was a very rapid tour of conformal prediction. I hope by now you're as enthusiastic about this subject as I am. Um, I just want to reiterate the importance of uncertainty quantification as we're using and deploying machine learning tools to actually in very sensitive application. And what I really like about the work of Larry Wasserman, Jean Lay, Vladimir Wolf, and all the people contributing to this field is they provide us with ideas that are applicable, in my view, to meet the highest professional standards when we report results in sensitive applications. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emmanuel, for a, a very interesting talk on conformal prediction. Um, given the time, I think I am not going to unmute uh, the people who ask questions, but I'm just going to read their questions aloud. Um, so we had a question from Jean-Christophe Mora, uh, who said that I had the impression that in non-technical discussions, fair or unbiased would mean that the outcome of the prediction does not depend on the status of the sensitive variable. But your notion is different. Is different. Is that correct? Yes, it is a different notion. Absolutely. So lots of uh, definition of fairness have been proposed, right? And so I think what you are referring to is perhaps something known under the name of equalized odds, where you ask for a certain form of conditional independence between your prediction and the true status. And what we're proposing is completely different. And there are cases, and if you look at the papers we wrote, where we believe that equalized odds can be diff it has to be applied with difficulty. So, so we propose a different notion. What we're proposing has nothing to do with equalized odds. Um, it's just what I want to do is I want to learn. Basically, we do statistics, machine learning, to learn from the experience of others, right? And so how, when I look at past examples, what did I learn? And so I want to be able to actually give a range of values um, that are that have the property that 90% or 95% of the time I'm actually correct. And I want this to be true no matter the group you belong to. I'm not trying to tell you, to give you a, a I'm not giving you a decision. The problem with a lot of machine learning is they give you a Y hat. They're gonna, they're gonna say, the algorithm will say, this inmate will recidivate or will not recidivate. And I find it very problematic because a judge gets something like this. And what are you supposed to do with this? When in fact, you're not sure. Um, I would like to briefly go also to uh, another question. Um, so, uh, Pratipa Jaganathan asks, how would we know if a score is a conformal score for a particular given problem? So any statistic you like is going to be a conformal score if you have holdout data that is somehow exchangeable. So as long as the, when you're scoring a data point, uh, it does not, it's basically things that, are, that do not depend on the ordering, right? So as long as when you score a data point, you, you maintain the property that you know, if you had IID data, the scores will be IID. This is perfectly valid. So this is where care needs, so it's a very good question. This is where care is required, because you cannot just do anything, but you have to make sure that your scores that you get at the end are exchangeable. Right. 
and then Sirio Legramanti as... For example, the order in which you get to see the data cannot play a role. Right, that seems uh, clear. You need that. Um, so there's one more question. Uh, uh, why always predictive intervals instead of more general sets? Very good question. We can build sets as well. And um, so, for example, if I go back to uh, the method we presented, we can build sets. So, for example, and that's kind of what we were doing when we were disc doing discrete, uh, discrete labels, right? We were looking at, uh, even if you look at the original work of Vladimir and, and Larry, um, when you look at, for example, you could say this, you could say, I'm going to fit a density function or a conditional density function, and I'm going to actually include in my prediction interval points for which a density function is sufficiently high. And that actually might actually create, instead of cutting in this way, you would cut this way. And that would actually create general sets. We prefer to stick with, for, his, you know, for in, reasons of interpretability, we prefer to stick with uh, intervals, but you could actually, of course, you can uh, build sets, and that's a very good observation as well. Yeah, it's, so my personal experience is that you, if you talk to doctors, for example, you can't explain, you can explain intervals, but not general sets. That's, <laughs> yeah. It will be right. very confusing. Yeah, so, um, but, 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 by, but this is a very good point. You can decide to actually retain in your prediction set y value so that your estimated conditional distribution is large enough. Right. Um, then a uh, final question, uh, very short. Uh, based upon the first part of your talk, can one make a connection between constructing tolerance limits in reliability in those fields and uh, the conformal ideas? Um, the connection between what reliability? Uh, tolerance limits in the field of reliability. Okay, so one thing I want to emphasize, I'm not sure I understand the question com completely, but one thing I want to emphasize is that what we can do, and I think that's a limitation of these methods at the moment, of course, is I can, I can construct prediction intervals for future observations. I cannot construct prediction intervals for things, for parameters, things I don't get to see. This whole idea is based on the fact that I have examples and when I have a test point, I have a form of exchangeability. So what we can do is we can actually pre construct predictive intervals, but every statistician knows that we cannot construct confidence intervals that hold regardless of the distribution of XY for parameters. And that's a limitation. So if the question is about Yes, can you use conformal prediction to estimate reliability in the sense that I want to predict future observations? The answer is yes. But if it's actually to predict a state of a system that I cannot observe, the answer is no. Okay, well, uh, I think that is actually still a very clear ans uh, answer. Uh, the askers all say thank you. So, uh, in light of the time, I think we have to wrap up. So, uh, Emmanuel, once again, thanks for a very enlightening talk. I would like to give an applause now, and I think the host life has to unmute everybody for that. Uh, one second. Well, thanks a lot for your attention and for staying up late, waking up early, and uh, I hope to okay. see you soon. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you.